<laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, We're starting. Hi. hi. <laughs> um, I'm Danelle. This is our monthly recite gathering that we do here at the Norman Williams Library. It's the first Tuesday of every month. We gather at 5.30. This usually actually starts around 5.45, but um, there's always a sign-up sheet posted in the library. You can sign up. If you don't sign up and just show up, that's totally fine, too. Um, and if you sign up and don't show up, we won't, like, ridicule you or anything. Um, but it's, it's just a lovely thing. We get together, and um, you can present whatever you feel like presenting. We've had people sing. We've had people do prose and poetry, stuff they've written, stuff other people have written. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a free thing, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. And we've been going for a good three years now. Yeah, three and a half. Three and a half years. So this is an established thing. It's pretty awesome. Um, and so um, I'm going to start out. The, so the, I work here at the library, too. And a couple, week and a half ago, we had our annual gala, which is an a annual dinner. We have you know fundraising thing to raise money for the library to help with all the stuff that we do and um, repairs that need to be made and things like that. And, um, and our speaker this year was a poet, Richard Blanco. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard people talk about him before and how great he is and how he's a great presenter and all of that. And I, but I had never seen him until, and, and he really is wonderful. Um, he was the inaugural poet for Obama. Um, and he has spoken here at Bookstock and he's published memoirs as well as books of poetry um, and his work is just lovely. Hey, first or second term? You never made that clear. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I thought and his most recent book of poetry is called How to Love a Country. Um, so I thought I'd read a few things out of here. And so um, one thing to know about Richard Blanco, he, he wouldn't I forget the exact wording, but he says that he was made in Cuba, born in Madrid, and raised in the United States. I think New York, I'm not positive. Yeah, he, came, he came to the United States when he was 45 days old. Like that. Okay, and I think to New York? Yeah, they landed in New York first. Okay, and yeah. He made their way to, he grew up mostly in Florida, in the Cuban community in Florida. Oh, okay, yeah. all right, and now lives in Maine. No, lives in Maine. Yes. And so, um, so he, he talks a lot about place and, you know, and so this is his new book of poetry and um, there's one poem about his father called My Father in English. <clears throat> My Father in English. First half of his life lived in Spanish the long syntax of Las Montañas that lined his village, the rhyme of soul with his soul, a Cuban alma that swayed with Las Palmas, the sharp rhythm of his machete cutting through the caña, the syllables of his canarios that sung into la brisa of the island home he left to spell out the second half of his life in English, the vernacular of New York City sleet, neon, glass and the brick factory where he learned to polish steel 12 hours a day, enough to save enough to buy a used Spanish-English dictionary he kept beside like a bi bedside like a Bible. Studied 15 new words after his prayers each night, then practiced them on us the next day. Buenos dias, indeed, my family. Indeed, mas coffee. Have a good day today, indeed. And again in the evening, Gracias to my Bella wife, indeed, for dinner. He his, his, his to homework, indeed. La vida es indeed difícil. <laughs> indeed did indeed become his favorite word, which, like the rest of his new life, he never quite grasped, overused and misused often to my embarrassment. Yet the word I most learned to love and know him through, indeed, the exile who tried to master the language he chose to master him. Indeed, the husband who refused to say I love you in English to my mother. The man who died without true translation. Indeed, meaning, in fact, an effecto. What I really, what I always meant to tell, oh, I'm sorry. 
meaning in reality, de hecho, meaning to say now what I always meant to tell him in both languages, thank you, gracias, for surrendering the past tense of your life so that I might conjugate myself here, in the present of this country, in truth. Así es, indeed. <laughs> um, and then there's another poem, which is, um, which is a great little poem. It, it's, and it's lovely because, you know, he has Cuba and Madrid and the United States, and this is about Limerick, Ireland. Leaving in the rain, Limerick, Ireland, for Caroline. I have no exact reason to miss you, your city, nor this island of yours, like everything, like nothing I had imagined. The plentiful wisdom of so much silver rain softening rock, spreading across pillows of green hills, rolling past the train's window, leaving Limerick after only a few days of knowing you and my life with your kin, teaching myself by teaching them to trust a poem's imagery, hear it as music enough to mend what we ourselves rend apart. I smiled your smile, answering me, no lad, limericks didn't come from here. Yet I felt poetry everywhere, in the brooding walls of King John's castle against your gray sky, in the daring of a few rays of sunlight each day striking the steel and glass of my hotel, in the granite sparkle of sidewalks solid underfoot on our daily lunchtime strolls to Dunas for bacon and pears. Also, bred to court the seagulls gathered every afternoon by the River Shannon, its tidal ebb and flow of recurring dream you noticed, reminding me to remember to forget myself twice every day. Why should your home be home to me? My eyes belong to another sea my feet to another island, Cuba, where rain falls differently. Yet the stranger on the train across the aisle could be my mother pulling turquoise yarn from a tote bag on the floor like a faithful dog sitting beside her swollen ankles. Her long needles, a soft rhythmic wetting of steel against steel, could be a cello in her spotted hands that don't remember or need her anymore to make, what, socks for her granddaughter, another sweater for her faraway son, a vest for her dead husband. Only she knows what she misses, what is, was, or will be home to her, knows the sorrow in every stitch as much as the joy pulled from each loop she pearls. Beside her, a bearded man sleeps. His furrowed brow and bony hands tell a story like the broken spine of the book face down on his lap, parted to words he couldn't finish too droll or terrifying for him, perhaps. I wonder if his eyes are green as ferns or brown as dirt, if they're dreaming of tigers or moonlight echoes or the timber of his father's voice. I wonder if he's leaving home or returning. Maybe he's a stranger like me, among strangers between points on the earth to which these tracks are nailed. Where am I? Where am I going? doesn't matter. What matters is the poem in the window, a blurred watercolor where tree is chimney, chimney is cloud, cloud is brick, brick is puddle, puddle is rain, and rain is me, refracted in each luscious bead. How free and impossible to be everything inside everything I see. How terribly beautiful never having to say I'm from here or there never recalling my childhood home where I played checkers alone, or the royal palms lining the street where I learned to ride my bike, or my mango-scented backyard catching fireflies like stars in glass jars, or my bedroom where I first heard my voice say, Richard, my name breaking me from the world, the world suddenly broken into geography, history, weather, language, war. I would like to die twice, Caroline, once to feel that last breath flood my body, then come back to tell of life not pulled apart, not dimensioned, a seamless mass at light speed before the dead stop of the train at 3.05, before the man wakes up, closes his book, forgets or vows to live his dream, before the woman stuffs her needles into her bag, stands up, sighs into the ache of her feet, 
before everything becomes itself again, brick into brick, tree into tree, cloud into cloud, puddle into puddle, me into me, standing on the platform knowing Pavese was right. You need a village, if only for the pleasure of leaving it. And someday returning to it, to your city, to you, and the rain we shared. There's one called yeah. Nov. Hmm? How about Sparrows? Do it later. You don't want me to do more now? Well, generally, um, you, you've created expectations. You should do one and do one later and do one later. That was a heavy one to take into. That was a heavy We should just sit with that one for a while. Yeah. I kind of like to shake things up and not do it the same every time. You know, create expectations then, uh, and rhythm, and then going, it's, you know. Baby. I can do it later. What I was going to say was not about a poem I was about to read. What I was going to say is that there's one called November Eyes, which is an amazing poem, but it's very political. Um, and so I wasn't going to read it. <laughs> I'll save one for later. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Richard, would you like to go next? Okay. Thanks. Richard Esky. Oh. Three poems, they're all related to uh, Walt Whitman because May 31st will be his 200th birthday. Oh. Which we all knew, right? So. <laughs> That his most famous poem, which Har Harold Bloom doesn't like, but I like it because I can memorize it, um, is um, in memory of President Lincoln. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear, the people all exulting, while follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But oh, heart, 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 oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung. For you, the bugle trills. For you, bouquets and ribbon wreaths. For you, the shores are crowding. For you, they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Oh, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel his arm, feel my arm. He has no pulse, no will. The ship is anchored safe and sound. Its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exalt those shores and ring no bells. But I, with mournful tread, walk the deck, my captain lie, fallen, cold, and dead. He used to recite that on April 15th, every year, April 15th is of course the day that uh, Lincoln died. Uh, he, you know, he lived, you know, he didn't die the day he was shot, but he died in the 15th. So um, the very last time that he recited that was, he would give a little talk on, on Lincoln and he was, it might have been the year, maybe the year before he died. He was not able to stand, he, he sat, and presented in New York City, and the place was absolutely crowded. And he got to the poem to, to end with, Oh, Captain McCabe broke down in tears. But he made it through. And uh, p famous people like Andrew Carnegie and other well-known people were in the crowd. It was just the most amazing thing. So, um, 
So uh, let's see. I got I got two more. Um, this is mine. Um, happy birthday, Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, America's august, amorous, pensive poet. We inhale your vaulting life and delicious lines once more on this day set aside to recall and rejoice in your gifts to us. Your timeless tome enlightens and enlivens our tomb-like days. May its leaves evergreen and garnish our languid landscapes. O oh, wise enchanter, sensual seer, and robust lover, insistently, subversively entering and ordering your essences into our sullen soul and sluggish senses, waft your intoxicating energy and bathe us in your magnetic presence that we might loaf and love on the beaches and banks of our frothing frontiers, embracing and singing the ecology of friendship, seeing and celebrating the beauty of being. O oh, Father, with tender eyes and affectionate lips, continue to resound and resend your waves and rivulets, refreshing the arid and unplowed acres of our lives in this our own uncivil, unkind time. Quiet and comfort our sad, soiled spirits with your soothing, swelling presence. Heal us into faithful reflections of your fancy. Like subtle electric fire for our faith, your birthday sagacity will master and odor us, not just today, but each day, so we, as comrades, will effuse and warble your reedy songs deep into our hankering, mystical hearts. Um. And now, um, if you've been to the um, Emily Dickinson house in Amherst, on the edge of the property, there's a statue, of, a sitting statue of Emily Dickinson and then Robert Frost. They're facing each other. Well, before I had gone there, I had read a couple of biographies of um, Walt Whitman, and he doesn't mention Emily Dickinson directly. So I know this is this is sort of hidden material, but in eight. I think it's, I have the date 1871. In fact, I have it May 31st, 1871, because about that time, Walt Whitman did go to Boston, Massachusetts, and then he went to Dartmouth College at the invitation of the students, not the faculty. The faculty objected, but the students invited him to speak at their commencement, and then he visited his sister and brother-in-law in Burlington, Vermont. So I have a side trip that he took as well, and I call it a Coe's cameo. Mm -hmm. And it takes place at the tea and ale room in Amherst, Massachusetts on May 31st, 1871. Walt Whitman is 52. Now, and he's, where was the tea and ale room? You have to imagine it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on. Well, it, sounds like it's, it, it sounds like in the Amherst Inn, and I Somewhat familiar with Amber, so I was like, I just made it up. I thought it sounded good. Because she drank tea, he drank ale. I didn't have a room that, that served them both, right? So Walt Whitman's 52, and this is what he says. I've traveled a long way merely to look on you, to touch you, for I could not die until I once looked on you. And Emily Dickinson, age 41, says, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. In fear thou comest, thou shalt go at such a gate of joy. Walt says, I am he that aches with amorous love. 
I come forthwith in your midst. I will be your poet. I give you fair warning before you attempt me further. I am not what you suppose, but different. I am stern, acrid, large, undissuadable, but I love you. I draw you to me to plant on you for the first time the lips of a determined man. And Emily says, wild nights, wild nights, were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Might I but more tonight in thee. And Walt says, here, to put your lips upon mine, I permit you. Come, I take you down <clears throat> underneath the impassive exterior. I will tell you what to say of me. Publish my name, hang up my picture as that of the tenderest lover. Emily says almost to herself, go slow, my soul, to feed thyself upon his rare approach. He touched me, so I lived to know that such a day permitted so. I groped upon his breast. It was a boundless place to me. And Walt says, now I place my hand upon you that you may be my poem. I should have chanted nothing but you. Oh, I could sing such grandeurs and glories about you. I will sing a song for you, ma femme. And Emily says, for thee a bee do I become. List even unto me. I cannot be ashamed because I cannot see the love you offer. Magnitude reverses modesty. Walt says, no longer abashed, for in this secluded spot, I can respond as I would not dare elsewhere. It is I you hold, and who holds you. I spring from the pages into your arms. Decease calls me forth. Oh, how your fingers drowse me. Your breath falls around me like dew. Your pulse lulls the tympans of my ears. I feel immersed from head to foot, delicious enough. Emily says, I cannot live with you. It would be life. And life is over there be behind the shelf. So we must meet apart. You there, I here. With just the door ajar. How beautiful this dream. What plenty it would be had all my life but been mistake, just rectified in thee? Walt says, the tale of cosmic elemental passion thou tellest to a kindred soul. I see and plainly list the talk and conference here. Thy ample smiling face dashed with the sparkling dimples of the sun. Would you the undulations of one wave, its trick to transfer it's trick to me transfer, or breathe one breath of yours upon my verse and leave its odor there. Emily says, is it delight or woe or terror that do decorate this livid interview? Neglected son of genius, I take thee by the hand. And Walt says, when I clutched your hand, it was not with terror. Goodbye, my fancy. Farewell, dear mate, dear love. I am going away. I know not where or, or to what fortune or whether I may ever see you again. So, goodbye, my fancy. <laughs> So May 31st is 200? May 31st. 200th birthday. 200th birthday. Okay. Um, let's see. Jennifer, would you like to go next? Sure. Jennifer Grant.
this poem is called Prom Night, and um, when I wrote it, I was reflecting back to when I attended my proms and how at that time uh, great importance was put on whether you got invited to the prom or not. And I uh, was uh, thinking about how for young women that the importance of that relative to their whole lives um, isn't really, they don't really realize the scale of that. Unfortunately times have changed and the sort of traditions around proms are different now, but this poem is really written um, about sort of the way proms used to be. So prom night. Copyright Jennifer Grant. They come in pinks, in peaches, blues, they who someone came to choose. But those who no one picked to call, they will never come at all. Youthful bodies, youthful faces, proportioned right in all right places. Youthful skin, no creases seen, wrinkle free at 17. Is this beauty everlasting, or is it just for prom night casting? Mm -hmm. They come in red, and turquoise too, whatever are the fashion hues. They come in sets with matching boys, shoes, corsages, prom time toys. Is this the peak of all success, prom queen crown and perfect dress? The riddle is, when prom night's gone, who'll leave a mark that lingers on? Who has a heart that's loving, giving? Who has zest and joy for living? Who has grace to call her own? Perhaps it's one who stayed at home. Beauty fades, and in its place, please, young maidens, leave your trace. Yes, proms have changed definitely, haven't they? Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. How about Bob? Would you like to go next? <laughs> Bob Burgess is next. I'll just say it then. We should get you a little gavel. 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 Yes. You've been following the news lately, people? You want permission to go to the bathroom? He has to give another drink before he hears you. <laughs> oh. Okay, I see I'm in for it tonight. Anyway, as is obvious, I like to make jokes, good, bad, have fun, and all that good stuff. But uh, these really are troubling times. And so I'm going to repeat some stuff you may have heard before, because they're worth repeating. And end it all with the usual question. But I think it's a good idea to start with a little comic relief. Don't you think, Dee? As it were, G. Albeit a bit cynical by sharing some well-known, somewhat poetic quotes from the past. Now, many of you here too young to remember. Uh, but you know of them. H.L. Mencken, famous journalist and essayist from a century ago that unfortunately still seem to apply to our current wonderful state of affairs as well. So he says regarding democracy, the vox populi, general state of humanity. He says, no one has ever lost money by underestimating the intelligence of the great masses of 
people. In fact, democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. It is a pathetic belief in the collective wisdom of individual ignorance. It is the art and science of running the circus from the monkey cage. Listen, folks, this is the fun part. If nobody's laughing, you ought to leave now because it's going to get worse. I'm serious, as you know. So on that optimistic note, let's move on to some real clear and present dangers, uh, some poetry regarding government, guns, and all the rest. And so this is, again, for those of you who heard it back at the Gun Sense Benefit or here, this is The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dim tide is loose, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely, surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Ah. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere, somewhere in, in sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what, what rough beast is it? Its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. This next one is contemporary and is called Bang. And some of you remember it. And some of you know who Blair Brooks is. And we've worked together on this some time ago and changed a few things. At the bottom of a painting by Charles White, called Banner for Willie J, sits the word bang. A circle in the center of the picture frames his nephew just sitting there out on the street in front of his house. He's just hanging and chilling on a hot summer day cool and easy, sitting there 
in his own doorway, strong, young, alive, his future in his face, hands, body, smile, suddenly shot dead on his own street in Chicago. Bang. In schools across the land, Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, innocents murdered, shot dead by assault rifles. In churches, synagogues, quietly, quietly, while people pray, suddenly, blood. In nightclubs, theaters, grocery stores, bang! It reverberates from the past, JFK, MLK, RFK, haunting those who can remember. Bang, one after another. We've grown numb now, numb to the sound. We stand still with paralyzed will, polarized, kill any bill. We listen to the shills who say, we need freedom to kill. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers have no meaning as victims lie bleeding. Our leaders aren't bleeding. The country is grieving. Students are pleading, never again. The next bang will kill our child, our friend, our hope, our faith our freedom in the name of freedom. Bang, senseless. Bang, crazy. Bang, dead. Just sitting in his own doorway. Thank you, the topic is too difficult. So I want to end it again with the usual question, confession, that some of you have heard and I always ask of myself as much as anyone else that continues to haunt people and hopefully it won't get realer in the next year. How much more are you going to take? How much longer you gonna wait? How bad does it have to get? I'll wait. Before you dare, how many more lies do we have to hear? How much more pain do you have to feel before breaking out of your gnawing fear and screaming out finally in a burst of freedom that you've had enough, no more, that's it, that you're not gonna take any more bullshit. How much longer are we gonna sit on the sidelines 
watching our own lives pass us by before we finally do something or die. Come on, folks, it's about time. What are you waiting for? Remember never again. The time is at hand. If not now, when? Thanks for listening. Um, wait, so I need my glasses. Sorry. So um, I think I'll read one more, then we'll have an intermission, and then we'll do the rest. And the one that I almost read before but didn't actually relates to what you just read. So, um, so you're saying it was like divine intervention yeah. that you did that? Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> that helps you. That's great. Um, so this is called. It's not the political one of November. This is a different one. It's called One Pulse, One Poem. Here, sit at my kitchen table. We need to write this together. Take a sip of cafe con leche. Breathe in the steam and our courage to face this page. Bare is our pain. Curl your fingers around mine, curled around my pen. Hold it like a talisman in our hands, shaking, eyes swollen. But let's not start with tears, or the flashing lights, the sirens, nor the faint voice over the cell phone when you heard I love you for the very last time. No, let's ease our way into this. Let our first lines praise the plentitude of morning, the sun exhaling light into the clouds. Let's imagine songbirds flocked at my window, hear them chirping a blessing in Spanish. Benediccion, benediccion, benediccion. Begin the next stanza with a constant wind trembling every palm tree, yet steadying our minds just enough to write out bullets, <coughs> bodies, death. The vocabulary of violence raging in our minds but still mute, choked in our throats. Leave some white space for a moment of silence, then fill it with lines repeating the rhythms pulsing through pulse that night. Salsa, deep house, electro, merengue, and techno heartbeats mixed with gunshots. Stop the echoes of that merciless music with a tender simile to honor the blood of our blood without writing blood. Use warm words to describe the cold bodies of our husbands, lovers, and wives, our sisters, brothers, and friends. Draw a metaphor so we can picture the choir of their invisible spirits rising with the smoke toward disco lights. Imagine ourselves dancing with them until the very end. Write one more stanza now. Set the page ablaze with the anger in the hollow ache of our bones. Anger for the new hate, same as the old kind of hate for the wrong, colors, wrong skin color, for the accent in a voice, for the love of those we're not supposed to love. Anger for the voice of politics armed with lies, fear that holds democracy at gunpoint. But let's not end here. Turn the poem. Find details for the love of the lives lost, still alive in photos. Spread them on the table. Give us their wish-filled eyes glowing over birthday candles, their unfinished sand castles, their training wheels, Mickey Mouse ears, tiaras. Show their blemished yearbook faces, silver teeth smiles and stiff prom poses. 
their tasseled caps and gowns, their first true loves, and then share their very last selfies. Let's place each memory like a star, the light of their past reaching us now and always, reminding us to keep writing until we never need to write a poem like this again. Okay, so now we need an intermission to lighten things up and then we'll do everybody else. <laughs> it's time. That's right, you've already done your thing and it was wonderful and now you can just... We'll just did pretend he's not there. That's what I do all the time. <laughs> okay, welcome back everybody. Um, one thing I forgot to say before was that we have our book here. Um, it, it would be great if everyone wanted to sign it. Um, just, you know, your presence here, whether you read or not, whatever you want, you can put comments and stuff, what you read or whatever you want to do. Um, but just it's a little posterity thing going on. I'm going to read one more Richard Blanco poem, just because he was so wonderful. Um, and this poem, that he read it at the gala, and um, it's called Until We Could, and it's for Mark, who is his partner. And he said, you know how sometimes writers will write things and then it becomes, I forget exactly how he said it, and then life, you know, imitates the art and things happen. And he wrote this poem and um, I don't even know if Mark knew that he had written it, but then Mark proposed to him. And so they are actually engaged to be married. They're not married yet, I think. They're still partners, but um, anyway, so this is about love. And I mean, I'm a woman reading this about, you know, um, but, it's, but it's about love and so it's wonderful. And um, I'll stop talking about it, I'll just read it. Until we could for Mark. I knew it then when we first found our eyes in our eyes and everything around us, even the din and smoke of the city disappeared, leaving us alone as if we were the only two men in the world, two mirrors face to face, my reflection in yours, yours in mine, infinite. I knew since I knew you, but we couldn't. I caught the sunlight pining through the shears, traveling millions of dark miles simply to graze your skin as I did that first dawn. I studied you sleeping beside me. I counted your eyelashes, read your dreams like butterflies flitting under your eyelids and ready to flutter into the room. Yes, I praised you like a majestic creature God forgot to create. Till that morning of you tamed in my arms, first for me to see, name you mine. Yes, to the rise and fall of your body, your every exhale and inhale, a breath I breathed as my own, wanting to keep even the air between us as one. Yes, to all of you. Yes, I knew. But still, we couldn't. I taught you how to dance salsa by looking into my Caribbean eyes. You learned to speak in my tongue while teaching me how to catch a snowflake in my palms. Love the gray clouds of your worn out hometown. Our years began collecting in glossy photos, timelining our lives across shelves and walls, glancing back at us. Us embracing in some sunset, more captivated by each other than the sky brushed palm rose. Us claiming some mountain that didn't matter as much as our climbing it together. Us leaning against columns of ruins as, as ancient as our love was new, or leaning into our dreams at a table flickering candle candlelight in our full mooned eyes. I knew me as much as us, and yet we couldn't. Though I forgave your blue eyes turning green each time you lied, kept believing you, though we managed to say good morning after muted nights in the same bed, Though every door slam told me to hold on by letting us go, and saying you're right became as true as saying I'm right, till there was nothing a long walk couldn't solve. Holding hands and hope under the street lights, lustering like a string of pearls guiding us home, or a stroll along the beach with our dog, the sea washed out by our smiles, our laughter roaring louder than the waves. 
though we understood our love was the same as our parents, though we dared to tell them so, and they understood. Though we knew, we couldn't. No one could. When fiery kick lines and fires were set for us by our founding mother's fathers at Stonewall, we first spoke of defiance. When we paraded glitter, leather, and rainbows, our word then became pride down city streets, demanding, just let us be. But that wasn't enough. Parades became rallies, bold words on signs, shouting until we all claimed freedom as another word for marriage and said, let us in, insisted love is love, proclaimed it in all eyes that would listen at any door that would open until no's and maybes turned into yeses, town by town, city by city, state by state, understanding us and all those who dared to say enough until the gavel struck into law what we always knew. Love is the right to say I do, and I do, and I do. And I do want us to see every tulip we've planted come up spring after spring, a hundred more years of dinners cooked over a shared glass of wine, and a thousand more movies in bed. I do until our eyes become voices speaking without speaking, until like a cloud meshed into a cloud, there's no more you, me, our names useless. I do want you to be the last face I see, your breath, my last breath. I do, I do, and will, and will, for those who still can't, vow it yet. But know love's exact reason as much as they know how a sail keeps the wind without breaking, or how roots dig away into the earth, or how the stars open their eyes to the night, or how a vine becomes one with the wall it loves, or how, when I hold you, you are rain in my hands. Okay, so let's see. John McGovern, would you like to go next? Sure. Put you right up there, just get it done. Okay, here. <laughs> well, I'd like to read a poem written by a uh, local author. Oh, <laughs> the author. <laughs> The author sits here with us today. Uh, the po uh, she has a, a book out. It's called Spring Took the Long Way Round, Poems by Brooke Herder James. And I want to read uh, the poem Spring Took the Long Way Around. Spring took the long way around. This year, a shy schoolgirl lingering along the field's edge as the boisterous ones gather their sleds, hang skates off hockey sticks, suck snow from soggy wool mittens and wander off. They stay too long and they know it, but the ice was so black and smooth. They call over their shoulders at the girl hesitating by the stone wall we're done here, it's all yours. She waits to be sure they are gone for good. Then, holding her skirts high above soft snow, she ambles across the pasture. This is mine now, she thinks as she breathes her warm breath such that the maples blush red at their tips and the last ice melts from the pond. Thank you. So maybe to continue in that vein, Brooke, would you like to go next? I just, it kind of makes sense. Brooke Herder James, right here. going to read that oh. one too. <laughs> That's okay, you did it better than I could. I like the way you read it. 
So here's a brand new one. This is also about love. Since you've been gone. Since you've been gone, I have existed on popcorn and Grey's Anatomy, so much so that when the inevitable gastric distress set in, I contemplated a trip to the ER in hopes that Dr. McDreamy might be on call. <laughs> Since you've been gone, I haven't read a book or taken a walk, even to the mailbox. I haven't talked to anyone except myself and Alexa. I think I fed the dog, but now I'm not sure. I did haul the recycling to the curb in my pink pig pajamas, the ones that for some reason remind you of the crazy lady down the street who had a pet rabbit that lived in her car. Honestly, since you've been gone, I've begun reconsidering my life on this hillside in the middle of nowhere. Good thing you only left yesterday and you're coming home tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, since we started on the theme of fathers, Richard Blanco, I have a poem, a poem, too, about my father. The first one, A Wednesday in May. A lilac-infused Wednesday in May, grocery list on the seat beside me, a one-finger wave to the road crew on Route 100 as I drive by. Then there he is, lying perfectly in the middle of my lane, so perfectly I don't even have to swerve. In the produce aisle, searching for leafy greens, I recall his face pointed skywards, tiny paws, touching one another across his soft gray breast, as if sunbathing on the warm black pavement or nodding off three pages into a book. Like my father, eyes paler blue than his faded striped cotton pajamas, his long fingers intertwined across his quiet chest, nails trim and clean, music drifts from the kitchen radio, mingles with the smell of city, pavement and garbage trucks and coffee, I lean in to smooth the sheets. One hour later on my way home, windows open, hot tar shimmering and workmen sitting on tailgates, the squirrel is still there. Dozens of cars must have straddled his tiny body, dozens of drivers like me wishing not to disturb his death. And this one in t called in Untitled. Uh, my father, unfortunately, didn't live long enough to meet our grandson, but I like to imagine them in the same room as they were both, one was sort of learning language and the other losing language. Untitled. I see you touch your tiny finger to the green rubber tip of your sneaker as you say, shoe, shoe, shoe. And I think of my father in the last year of his life, tapping the clean trimmed nail of his right pointer finger against the car window, reading out loud every sign as we pass by. Route 495, Hebert's Candies, Whistle's Junk Shop. Then at dinner, he's quiet having lost the word for the dish of vegetables he wishes to try. If only you had been there to prompt him across the table, in your high chair, dropping peas, peas, peas onto the wooden floor. Ah, yes, peas, he would have laughed too. You and he, unlikely confederates in the ordination of this world. All right, and one more. Uh, this too is about love. Every morning now, every morning now the donkey wanders from the barn to the apple tree on the path they made together. She stops just shy of the fence, leaving room for her misplaced donkey friend. I imagine you or I will do the same. We'll forever pour coffee for two. <laughs> Thank you.
quick. Uh, Yash, would you like to go next? This has been quite an evening, and uh, somehow to keep the flow going, we've had such a range of poems that have struck me deeply. And uh, so, well, with that said, I'm going to start with, uh, it's time to meet Pharaoh. <laughs> Yeah, Zach, Pharaoh coming? That's Pharaoh coming. <laughs> Where are you? No? But, um, you know, it, it's interesting when we talk about our political environment to think, of course, that there was a whole system uh, in Egypt at the time that served to glorify and deify uh, a single man. And to, as an author, to set yourself to try to imagine this man in the flesh is, is in a way, um, uh, talk about unsettling, it's totally unsettling. <laughs> and yet, what do we have today but somehow a system that has created a juvenile crybaby as our state leader. So I don't think of Pharaoh as a juvenile crybaby either. Uh, but that's my opinion. <laughs> I'll let you forge your own. Um, of course, all you have to do is read the Bible and project whatever you think about uh, a, uh, a total de being in the position of uh, a total despot. And um, uh, anyway. Whatever. Here we go. <laughs> Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh had arrived from his capital. He had come for his annual visit, which would strike fear into each official he knew. Bored but restless, he could not sit. He stood, gazing out from a high terrace at the lines of laborers carrying his goods into his palace. By my grace, he mused, they labor, never tarrying at physical service, always striving to please their pharaoh, like trained animals. And he wondered, am I not a living God? He turned toward waiting, his waiting officials, walked past them into his chambers. The door, he ordered, it closed. He lay on a chair. A small fire burned on a hanging censer for a god's devotion. He did not care to remember. But he stared at its flames, drawn down into thoughts he would never share. How bored he felt. He had all his great names, but could see no great war to fight. Nowhere to exercise his limbs in fatal strain. Ah, some righteous conflict. He envisioned masses of dead soldiers around him slain by his arrows. A vision imagined and then immediately rejected. For he had no reason for engaging another kingdom in war. Dejected, he paced. No war could he plan on waging without an appropriate foe. Father, I curse you for being so successful. He startled himself with his thought. Bother, he spoke, but inclined his head with a pull of his beard. Not of thou, O rise, speak, I am your servant. And he mentally added, of course. With his atonement, weak as it was, completed, he could not be at peace with himself. Fidgeting, alone, vapid dissatisfaction engulfed him. He felt constricted. He had only shown his might in one war, displaying his grim brutality proudly and suppressing 
Assyrian rebellion. There shone his splendor, he mused. Where is it now? Pressing ritual sapped his joy. All seemed amiss. In his heart he felt his reign as Pharaoh should be. It was not of pleasure for him. Even if I call for a maiden who is beyond compare, she'll fear me. A whim entered his mind. He could have such a one cut off the nose of the official who had addressed him once as the great Amman. That would elevate her to how he knew he was feared. But his mind went in circles. He could see no escape from his power, the fear it created, or dull cycles of life. He felt lowly, aware the hour of his worship had arrived. Well then, we need be the one true Amon Ra, the God Supreme. As he began to get ready to be both worshipped, he picked up his rod of kingship and divinity and to worship he consciously questioned how he could be confused in his thoughts and be true to his divinity. So perhaps we need to surrender power. <laughs> For one, I will surely find a way to bring it back to myself or leave it for my son to achieve in his reign. He tried to fit more securely his headdress Yet, it was not, yet he was not certain it was evenly balanced. He rang a bell and a servant came as quickly as he could. Mirrored, Pharaoh glanced at his reflection. A copper mirror the servant held. Pharaoh was satisfied. He walked to a temple's interior to worship, be worshiped, and deified. <laughs> Pharaoh. <sighs> So, uh, that's a very, it's like the most intense chapter maybe in the whole book because everything else is to a certain extent an unraveling of, uh, of that vanity for Pharaoh, at least of the, the, uh, the first book in this, in this book. Okay, but it is springtime and I want to keep lifting this up. Um, and I think this is a very appropriate poem to follow. Of course, it is my um, beloved Rilke. And uh, I know of nobody that, I, I thought of it this month as I was memorizing and reciting this poem to myself that in one of my poems I talked about um, the, or the narrator talks about having seen the veil of eternity. And I read these poems and I think to myself, man, Rilke <laughs> describes the veil of eternity. So here it is. <clears throat> we have to do with flower, vine leaf, fruit. They speak the language not only of the year. Out of darkness <clears throat> rises a motley manifest, having perhaps the gleam of the jealousy of the dead about it who invigorate the earth. What do we know of their share in this? It has long been their way to marrow the loam through and through with their free marrow. The only question, do they do it gladly? Does this fruit, a work of heavy slaves, push up, clenched to us, to their masters. Are they the masters who sleep with the roots and grant to us out of their overflow this hybrid thing made of dumb strength and kisses? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm afraid I'd love always reciting three poems because it seems to create a so if I just come up with one out of my head all right this one has been floating around in my head <laughs> so here it goes uh, she hides and it's a spring poem 
you know, spring, is, we associate with love, and certainly we got the insert from the Valley News of the marriage uh, <laughs> segment, so here we go. Uh, <clears throat> she hides his longing in her, in her soul. She listens to these words in her beauty. She lets them run through her mind and her heart and through her body. They make her feel whole. Her he adores in love's sacred duty. Never alone, they are never apart. In darkest dreams of night, they see light in their eyes. They are undone by love's law. Love. In the morning, she brushes her hair. The day offers her each petite delight. She cannot remember all that she saw, but her heart's divine fire is self-aware. Outside her window, the rain is falling, and someone whose name, whose voice is calling. It is fun how the themes, you know, happen at these events. Um, okay, we have one more poet, Mr. Gavin Wincoop Fisher. Thank you. Good evening. I guess this is working. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to do. Just a spattering of poems, I guess, um, on some different themes, but maybe kind of try to link them together. Um, and I think I've done this one here, maybe, but I'm feeling like doing it. Uh, I call this one Miraculous. No one thought to put miracles on the endangered list, even as the self-assured scientists pressed Pressed in banishing the magic from biomechanism, I see a spell burying its teeth to the light, chased into the corner by a steady march of reason wielding white coats and those who woke to find the feathers had fallen from their dream catchers. The talking stick choked to stillness, the sparks vacated the fingertips. They woke to a very dull alarm. An era of Darwin banners waved into a thin, windless sky. A chorus of quarterly journals dryly scanned, broken down into semi-relevant fact bits. Morsels of knowledge that may fatten one's reason and flatten doubts, but they would starve the ears and imaginings of any chubby-cheeked angel. And the engineers run the numbers for another cold monument to the madness of man. A plot to scrape the sky, to scar the bellies of the clouds like so many casual sea sections, the cherubs shaken loose and falling like strange birds poisoned from their perches, this glimpse of glittered tail incandescent wingspan, the last dragon sighs and flaps ever further until the earth is still and small again, an untiring little marble, our last miracle spinning inexplicably strung up in the void. The men below will all agree that they'd never seen a drone fly so high. It is assumed, of course, that it must be that shifty and secretive brand of science, shiny new weapons birthed by the state behind mechanical doors, and they marvel at man's murderous accomplishments and add more broken wands to the bonfire and shake their own hands and applaud the last breaths of wonder, and then each in his time turns quietly and walks from the light with a knot like poison in his guts, and there is blood still beating through the body, but each will find the same vacancy, the absent glow, now a shadow on the heart. Thank you. Um, there's sort of a dragon tail in there. Um, I, 
kind of like dragons. So uh, this isn't exactly about that, but uh, this is my most recent poem that I sort of wrote in my head a week ago or so. Before they knew how fucked up life is, they spoke facts about dragonflies from their backs on the dock. They knew they were in love, and somehow that same love resembled a gleaming blue beast on fast wings, nobility and glory and flash and teeth and them watching a bug in summer, love intercepting the parasites that crooned for their blood. Wow. That's a summer one. Um, I think that one's kind of nice. Uh, what did I mark? What was her name? My name is Gavin. No, what was her name? Uh, her name? That, yeah, that one I made up, actually, out of nowhere. So, I don't know. That one's for the kids. <laughs> the kids in love, I hope. Um, after the last time I read it, artistry, um, I read a few poems a trio of birds. Um, crows come up in my poetry a lot as a symbol of grieving and death and um, sort of passing on. And uh, that's not original, but <laughs> uh, I wrote great poems about crows. But this one has to do with those poems in that night. <clears throat> the grizzled man leans in. He's the type to be typecast as shady vet in the net next Netflix original. And he leans in long, tooth and gray hair stringing under his tattered brim. And I'd just taken the mic and spilled the shards of my pitiful childish heart. The words lined up proudly like a boy's trophies, trinkets, feathers, broken blades. Like, aren't I special? Look what I made. And the man leans in. His eyes shine, reach for mine, suddenly returning to humanity with a clasp of hands. I know those crows too, man. Yeah, that was a good experience because it uh, reminded me not to judge people. You show people yourself and they'll do the same. It's pretty great. Um, so one more. And uh, this is kind of a rainy day one. And I guess, I don't know, I don't know what love is, but this is sort of a love poem. But uh, it didn't last or anything. But um, it's a, I call this chemistry and weather. I wasn't exactly surprised to perceive the tiny tracings like fingerprints of lightning etched over her thighs. I'd already seen its flicker behind her eyes. Shine like celestial flash bulbs saturating Svalbard ice flows like she knows. So much that I don't. Like some fresh Norse myth cracked the strata cumulus, gathered her dust rains and ions in, stuffed her electric pockets full, and finally inpinned her unruly halo with fresh nicked slivers of sunshine. And adorned just so she divined her decline. Dance down, clouds collapsing around, tiptoe twirling upon effervescent treads, past haphazard crackling threads like vicious blue stitches in the roiling black belly of the sky till the storm subsided and she stood stone still like a plasma hewn marble masterpiece radiating invisible vibrations in the corner of the kitchen lazily buzzing excitement into every electron engaged by her gaze but me i'm frozen puzzled to discover the lack of cold in her shoulders as the particles frenzy and scatter in little puffs of elation till the air it was emptied between us and with conviction that comes from raindrop drums and thunderhead tongues she sings says so slowly I see you, and I believe that's true. Thank you. We've done it. We've done recite again. Thank you, everybody. Come back in June. Thanks. Sign the book. The 
your friends. <laughs>